Right now, something extraordinary is happening in the Australian outback. Lake Air, a salt-crusted depression that sits 15 meters below sea level, is filling with water for the first time in over a decade. Floodwaters are rushing down ancient channels, transforming one of Earth's driest places into a temporary inland sea visible from space. But here's what most people don't know. For over a century, Australia has been planning to make this permanent. We're talking about a $200 billion project to flood an area larger than Belgium, redirect entire river systems, and fundamentally alter the climate of the continent. But how is this even possible? And how is Australia planning to achieve this? Let's find out in this video. Lake Eyre sits at the bottom of Australia's greatest geographical oddity. One sixth of the entire continent drains toward this spot an area covering 1.2 million square kilometers. Water from Queensland, South Australia, and the Northern Territory all flows toward the same endpoint. Yet this endpoint happens to be in the driest region of the country. The basin is what geologists call endorheic, meaning water flows in, but never flows out. It's a continental bathtub with no drain. Between 140 and 100 million years ago, this wasn't a desert at all. The Aromanga Sea covered much of central Australia, a shallow inland ocean teeming with prehistoric marine reptiles and giant ammonites. Fossils of these ancient creatures still emerge from the red dirt today, proof that this land once knew water intimately. When European explorers first ventured into Australia's interior in the 1800s, they expected to find remnants of this aquatic past. Charles Sturt, one of the most determined explorers was convinced a great inland river system, or lake, existed somewhere in the continent's heart. Instead, he found endless desert and salt pans that stretched to the horizon. But Sturt's instinct wasn't entirely wrong. Every decade or so, when monsoonal rains pound Queensland's north, the desert transforms. Water rushes down the Diamantina and Cooper Creek, filling Lake Eyre in a matter of weeks. Pelicans arrive in their thousands. Fish appear seemingly from nowhere and the entire ecosystem explodes into life. Then, just as quickly, the brutal outback sun evaporates it all away. The lake returns to its natural state, a blinding white salt crust that can be seen from space, sitting 15 meters below sea level, waiting for the next flood. This cycle has repeated for millennia, but in the 1930s, one man looked at this pattern and saw opportunity instead of inevitability. The question that obsessed early Australian planners was simple but profound. What if we could keep the water here permanently? Dr. John Bradfield had the answer, but it was too big and almost impractical to attempt. Dr. John Bradfield wasn't just any engineer. In 1932, he completed the Sydney Harbour Bridge, a feat that required moving 52,800 tons of steel and connecting two sides of a harbor with a single arch span. The bridge became an instant icon and Bradfield became a national hero. Fresh off this triumph, he turned his attention to something far more ambitious, reshaping the Australian continent itself. In 1938, Bradfield unveiled his grand scheme. He proposed building a 2,300 kilometer network of dams, tunnels, aqueducts, and canals to capture Queensland's tropical rivers, the Tully, Herbert, and Burdekin, and redirect them inland toward Lake Eyre. These rivers dump enormous volumes of water into the ocean every wet season, water that Bradfield considered wasted. His plan would intercept this flow send it through the Great Dividing Range via massive tunnels and channel it westward into the parched interior. The centerpiece would be Lake Eyre itself, transformed from an occasional wetland into a permanent inland sea. Bradfield's vision was intoxicating. He promised hydroelectric power from the water flowing through his tunnels, agricultural land that could rival California's Central Valley, and even climate modification. He argued that a permanent body of water would increase rainfall, cool the surrounding desert, and create a thriving economic zone in Australia's dead center. Depression-era Australia, desperate for jobs and hope, embraced the idea enthusiastically. Politicians campaigned on it, newspapers ran breathless features, and farmers dreamed of green fields where only spinifex grew. But the dream had a fatal flaw. 
1947, engineer W.H.R. Nimmo reviewed Bradfield's calculations and discovered a catastrophic error. Bradfield had used German hydrological formulas designed for temperate European rivers and applied them to tropical Australian conditions. He overestimated the available water by a factor of 2.5. The rivers simply didn't carry enough volume to sustain his inland sea. Evaporation rates in the outback, which reach temperatures above 40 degrees Celsius for months on end, would drain water 10 times faster than rainfall could replenish it. The scheme would require perpetual refilling, a Sisyphean task that defied both economics and physics. By the 1960s, the world witnessed what happens when you divert rivers for grand ambitions. The Soviet Union's Aral Sea, once the fourth largest lake on Earth, shrank by 90% after rivers were redirected for cotton irrigation. Toxic dust storms swept across the region, and fishing villages found themselves stranded 100 kilometers from water. Australia took note, and the Bradfield scheme quietly died. But the idea never truly disappeared. It lingered like a ghost in Australia, waiting for someone to resurrect it. In 1919, Deputy Prime Minister Barnaby Joyce stood before cameras and declared it was time to revisit the Bradfield scheme. Politicians in Queensland, particularly Bob Cater, had been pushing variations of the plan since the 1980s, but Joyce's endorsement reignited serious discussion. The government commissioned the CSIRO, Australia's premier scientific research organization, to conduct a comprehensive feasibility study. What emerged in 2020 and 2021 was the most detailed analysis the scheme had ever received. The CSIRO's verdict was clinical and devastating. Yes, the project was technically feasible with modern engineering. You could build the infrastructure, but the economics made no sense whatsoever. The minimum cost would be between 12 and 20 billion dollars, and that's before, accounting for the inevitable overruns that plague mega projects. Water would need to be pumped uphill and transported over 2,000 kilometers, tripling the cost compared to local water sources. Farmers receiving this water would pay $970 per megaliter, a price so high it would bankrupt agriculture rather than save it. And critically, only half of Bradfield's estimated water was actually available. The rivers couldn't support both coastal communities and an inland sea. Queensland commissioned its own independent review in 2022, led by Professor Ross Garnott. The panel's conclusion matched the CSIRO's. There simply isn't enough consistent water. Tropical rivers experience massive seasonal variation. They flood dramatically during the wet season, but often run low during the dry months. You can't build a permanent inland sea on inconsistent supply. Modern proposals have tried to sidestep these problems with new technology. The Australian Inland Sea Project 2.0 suggests using solar-powered desalination plants on the coast to pump seawater 600 kilometers inland. Proponents argue that saltwater reduces evaporation and solar energy makes it sustainable but the costs explode even further, potentially exceeding $200 billion just for the pipeline infrastructure. And saltwater creates its own nightmare. It would sterilize the soil, making agriculture impossible, and creating a dead sea rather than an oasis. The fundamental problem hasn't changed since Bradfield's time. You're trying to fill a bathtub that has no drain, sitting in one of the hottest, driest environments on Earth where evaporation occurs at rates that mock human ambition. Mega projects like Egypt's Toshka Lakes and Lake Kariba succeeded because they had defined purposes and sustainable water sources. Toshka was built to reclaim desert for agriculture using Nile water. Kariba generates hydroelectricity for two nations. Both are smaller than the proposed Bradfield Sea, and both had clearer economic justifications. Australia's Inland Sea has always struggled to articulate what problem it actually solves that couldn't be addressed more cheaply through conventional means. But CSIRO didn't just reject the Bradfield scheme in its 2021 report. It offered an alternative that makes considerably more sense. Use water where it falls. Instead of building 2,000-kilometer canals to move water across a continent, invest in local infrastructure that captures and stores water in the regions that already receive it. Build smaller dams, improve irrigation efficiency, 
and develop regional water grids that can share resources during emergencies. This approach costs a fraction of the Inland Sea Scheme, creates fewer ecological disruptions, and doesn't require betting the farm on experimental climate modification. Queensland's 2022 panel suggested a middle path they called Mini Bradfield. Rather than one massive system, create four separate regional water grids with temporary connections that activate during extreme droughts. This gives you flexibility without the enormous fixed costs and environmental risks of a permanent diversion. When water is abundant, each region operates independently. When drought strikes, you can share resources across connected grids. But these sensible alternatives don't capture the imagination the way an inland sea does. Australia has always had a complicated relationship with its interior. The outback represents both the nation's identity and its greatest challenge. Droughts devastate farming communities, bushfires consume entire regions, and climate change is making everything worse. The 2019-20 Black Summer saw temperatures that broke all records. Towns ran completely dry, and thousands of Australians watched their homes burn. In that context, the idea of a massive water reserve in the continent's center feels like salvation. This is where national psychology matters. Australia built its reputation on audacious projects. The Snowy Mountain Scheme diverted rivers through mountains to generate power and irrigate the southeast. It worked brilliantly and became a point of national pride. The Bradfield Scheme taps into that same nation-building mythology. It promises to turn a perceived weakness, the empty interior, into a strength. Politicians love it because it sounds visionary. And voters respond to the symbolism even when the economics don't work. The current lake air floods demonstrate nature's own solution. Without spending a dollar, the basin is filling naturally, creating exactly the ecological benefits that Bradfield promised. Bird life is exploding, tourism is booming, and the surrounding regions are getting rainfall benefits. The difference is that this is temporary and self-regulating. When the water evaporates, the system resets. There's no perpetual maintenance cost, no salinity crisis building over decades, and no communities permanently displaced. So, what do you think about this? Should Australia take the $200 billion gamble and flood the outback, or stick with smaller, smarter water solutions? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. If you found this deep dive fascinating, please give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more incredible mega project stories. Until next time, stay curious.